I'd like to welcome you to the session on Arctic Ocean Technology, Opportunities and Challenges for Emergency Preparedness. My name is Neda Gonzalez. Um, I'm a senior consultant with uh, Concilium Consulting Group here in Ottawa. I'd like to um, introduce to you our uh, distinguished panel. We have three panelists today. Uh, they will be speaking uh, 15 minutes each on their topic, and then we will open the floor to questions. Our first speaker is John Higginbotham. Uh, he will be speaking um, about international perspectives on Arctic Ocean technology. He is uh, with the Center for International Governance and Preparedness uh, with the University of uh, Carleton University, a senior fellow there since February 2013. And he is an expert on international economic relations, maritime, air, road, rail transportation systems and systems of government. Uh, he has a vast experience uh, in government. He has been an assistant deputy minister with the departments of transport, uh, foreign affairs, <clears throat> and uh, I. Th one other department. Which one is that, John? Canada School of Public Service. Thank you. He also had uh, postings abroad, six years in Washington, five years in Hong Kong, and, uh, and a number of years in Beijing. Uh, Mr. Hithenbotham speaks English, French, and Chinese. He was educated at the University of Saskatchewan, McGill University, and Harvard. Our second speaker <coughs> is Ms. Susan Heliwell. She will be speaking on the medical aspects of emergency response. Susan is the CEO of Praxis Medical Group, which includes Praxis Emergency Specialists and Pi Software Incorporated. Praxis has been providing telemedicine and staffing support for clients with remote operations since 1997. Clients for Praxis include the Canadian Navy, the Canadian Coast Guard, companies in oil and gas, uh, the marine sector, fishing fleets, as well as prisons. In May of 2013, Praxis was engaged by Clipper Ventures Round the World Race to be their official suppliers of emergency medical support services. Pi Software Incorporated is the creator of EMWorks software system, which includes modules such as electronic medical record, a personal health record, remote clinic scheduling, tracking of personal credentials and training, incident management, and the clients in that area include the Manitoba Fire Commission, Nova Scotia Ground Search and Rescue, uh, Clearwater Fleet, and, and various ocean contractors. Uh, our last uh, panelist is Leonard Huey, who is with uh, the company Absolute Track. Uh, he will be speaking about emergency coordination services for northern operators and citizens, and a center that uh, is now operating out of Yellowknife. Leonard Huey has a rich experience with wireless telecommunication industries that has propelled him to become an industry leader in this area. He has over 13 years experience in this area and his portfolio consists of planning and implementing wireless product launches uh, and in the areas of tablets and businesses, managing a multi-OS environment and understanding the M2M landscape. And hopefully Leonard will explain to us all what all those wonderful acronyms mean. Um, and he joined Absolute Track in November of 2012 as the Vice President of Business Development. So I look forward to these three presentations and uh, I hope we have an enjoyable morning. Thank you very much. Anyway. This, this is the Arctic, as you are well aware. I apologize to, to all those people here who know far more about the detail of what I'm going to talk about, or some of the things I'm going to talk about than others. But I have been looking at this issue of the Arctic in some depth for the last two or three years, and I've been deeply impressed by the very rapid increased focus on uh, economic development and particularly maritime economic development uh, in the Arctic for the, for the last few years. 
while the term a race for the Arctic resources is a bit of an exaggeration given the very difficult conditions we have up there, and in some cases the re regulatory obstacles to rapid development, it, it remains, I think, one of the most uh, exciting areas of uh, uh, Canadian and uh, global economic development. We have, just to remind ourselves of the, the, the state of the Arctic, we have a massive Russian presence, massive Russian effort going back to the days of Stalin uh, for the development of Arctic maritime navigation, uh, but now a, a very much renewed interest under, the, under Russia as opposed to the Soviet Union uh, in terms of Arctic, economic develop Arctic marine economic development. I'll talk more about that later. Obviously, Alaska is very different from Canada in respect of its uh, uh, development. It's, it's uh, had the full weight of a superpower's economic development over the, over the years, ranging from Prudhoe Bay to, uh, to um, very large uh, defense expenditures and strong capabilities. Canada is quite backward in this, uh, in this area for uh, historical reasons. Uh, we do not have the uh, the population or the economic or the or the uh, development projects in operation of, of the rest of the rest of the Arctic has. Uh, we have a long way to go, uh, but we have enormous potential. Then we have the Scandinavian countries, which are are Arctic geographically in that they're north of the Arctic Circle, but it's open water, so the uh, the their great experience in ice, for example, comes more out of, uh, out of uh, Finland and Sweden than it does out of the Arctic above, um, uh, above uh, Norway. So I'm just going to go through a few pictures to ask why we are here, why we are paying so much attention. And it really does flow from this, this historic uh, geographic change in the extent and volume of Arctic ice. This is one estimate of, of how the uh, ice cap will look over the next uh, 40, 50 years, 20 years. It's improving navigation, making navigation easier now, and it will make it much easier in future if these trends continue. What we will be seeing is the development of a, essentially an Arctic maritime economy like north of Norway. Uh, over the next uh, 30, 40 years. This is a, a tremendous change in terms of accessibility for uh, communities, for destinational shipping, for tourism, for project development, uh, uh, and even for, in the case of Canada, uh, even some prospects for transpolar, uh, transpolar travel. Uh, the, some efforts are going into that now uh, from governments and other people. However, we probably have a long way to go. This is another picture of that trend of ice in the Arctic area. In this case, talking about the age of the ice. Arctic ice depends on uh, the older it is, the harder it is, thicker it is. Very tough for icebreakers to go through old ice. This is, this is 20, 25 years ago. The darker color indicates thicker old ice. This is more recent and it shows the, the, the volume of ice and, the, and, the, uh, uh, and the, the toughness of the ice is steadily decreasing. This is the trend line. I know everyone knows this, but if we don't keep remembering this is the reason the Arctic is getting so much attention now over uh, resources and uh, over uh, over the legal issues related to the Arctic, we are we we will forget the big picture and not think farther enough in, into the future. This is another estimate of what the uh, shipping lines will look like uh, over the next uh, 40, 50 years, with the uh, the blue lines indicating. Um, uh, conventional vessels and the red lines indicating uh, 
indicating ice-hardened vessels. This, this issue of Arctic shipping has become a very uh, important priority for Canada in its Arctic Council uh, uh, role. Uh, there's a lot of action going on in other international organizations as well. But I think it, it very much raises the question of, of, of uh, safety in respect of the Arctic. That's, I think, the key link of this panel, in my mind, is that we now face a very high public bar, uh, the social license required to uh, permit uh, expanded uh, oil and gas development, petrochemical development, and shipping up in the Arctic. The, the consequences of a serious problem, a serious accident up in the Arctic, a marine accident, a, a big oil spill, uh, uh, we are, I think that would set us back 10 or 20 years in terms of Arctic development. That's why a tremendous amount of effort has to be front-loaded in respect of uh, efforts to increase search and rescue, uh, accident prevention, and uh, search and rescue response in the north. It's, it's an indispensable part of economic development now. Uh, we have a lot of activity up in the Arctic. This is a this is a sort of floating condo that went through called the World that went through the Northwest Passage uh, a couple of years ago. It was not ice hardened. The Northwest Passage was completely open. But again, a, a year earlier, we had a, a really serious accident where a small Arctic cruise vessel. Uh, ran aground on a reef that was uh, not marked on our charts. That's because we have a very serious problem, particularly in northern Canada, in lack of first-class charting, which is essential for safe navigation. This ship was uh, not just lucky, it was extremely well, uh, it was a very well-managed uh, trip. They, they, had an experienced ice pilot on board. It passed all the insurance requirements. Uh, it, in fact, had a small, small boats going back and forth ahead of it to recheck the soundings to make sure it was uh, going through safe waters. These are the main Arctic shipping routes that are becoming more and more uh, prominent. The uh, obviously the. The Northern Sea Route, which I'll, I'll talk about in a moment, is by far the most important. This is, uh, this is rebuilding, in a sense, the very massive effort the Soviet Union had in terms of Arctic shipping, serving all these ports and rivers in this area. They have set up a Northern Sea Route administration. They're investing in very sophisticated uh, uh, they have exi existing nuclear icebreakers, they're building new ones, they're, uh, uh, they're buying new sophisticated icebreakers from Finland. This is all aimed at developing the northern sea route here as a shorter, more efficient, more environmentally uh, sound um, alternative to the Suez Canal. It saves money, uh, it's, it's going to be a complement uh, there were only 60 ships. There were 60 ships that went through transiting the Northern Sea Route uh, last year, 60, 65. Uh, but of course, there were hundreds of ships that did kind of destinational shipping in and out of these uh, of these ports and developments in the Siberian Arctic. Uh, they particularly have very large oil and gas developments uh, in the Yamal Peninsula. These two sides of the same coin, the Northern Sea Route and the, uh, and the, uh, uh, the oil and gas development up there are very much part of uh, Putin's uh, effort to uh, open up in the Arctic as a kind of way for a renaissance of Russia after the collapse of the Soviet Union and to achieve uh, Russia's economic 
long-term historical goals of more access to, to, to the open sea. So this is a remarkable coincidence of the, of the, uh, of, uh, the melting Arctic and his desires for a, uh, a, re a renaissance of, of, of Russia after the trauma of the end of Russia, Soviet Union. This mid-Atlantic, mid-Pacific, mid-Arctic mid route is years off. You can get through it. I mean, the giant Russian icebreakers can go up there almost any time they want, but it's by no means economic. In this, in this northern sea route, uh, the Russians have very strict regulations in respect to who can go through it, uh, who is on it, what type of ship, what kind of cargo. They pay fees to the Russian uh, Northern Sea Route Administration. Uh, it's, it's, it's closely regulated and it's seen over the very long term as a money-making operation for Russia. Canada is, uh, is, has put essentially no effort into transpolar uh, navigation per se, though some of the, obviously there is interest in that. Last year, the uh, a ship called the Nordic Orion, rather surprisingly, uh, picked up coal in uh, in Vancouver and brought it through the uh, the Northwest Passage uh, to Finland. Uh, and that was our one our one transit of a fully commercial vessel. That company has promised more more surprises over the next uh, next few years. But. Uh, that that, uh, that shows the increasing interest in the uh, in the northern sea route. There's many different possibilities, even for Canada to over the long term to develop sea routes from East Asia through the Northwest Passage to Eastern Canada and Eastern USA. That that's a more economical route than taking the northern sea route. Uh, uh, through northern Russia to East Coast USA. I spend a lot of time at Transport Canada working on something called the Pacific Gateway Initiative, so I know how much competition there is in, in the world's freight, freight market on the routings uh, from Asia to East Coast USA. We're having an expansion of the Panama Canal shortly. That will change patterns. This too could change global shipping packer, pack, uh, uh, patterns remarkably over the next, uh, the next few decades. And, I, and I, I really believe we should be thinking that far ahead. Even this route is one that uh, I fantasize about because it's easier to get from, it's shorter to get from Seattle to, uh, to Newark, to New Jersey through the Northwest Passage than it is uh, uh, through the Panama Canal. This, but we need to put it in perspective. These are uh, global shipping traffic. Almost nothing goes through here by, by current standards. There's 18,000 transits a year through the Suez Canal. So we're really talking about very, very modest, very, very beginnings of, uh, of, of shipping routes in a, in a very difficult environment. And where, as I said before, safety and security is absolutely critical. This is the northern sea route. These are the, the different uh, uh, river systems and ports that uh, the Russians have amalgamated under the northern sea route administration. This was a Chinese uh, vessel that went through last year, commercial vessel, one of the, one of the 65 ships that went through. Not a big container ship, but uh, simply done, I think, uh, many of these are done for, for kind of prestige reasons or experimental reasons. But through the Northern Sea Route, there, every class of vessel has gone through now, uh, LNG, tankers, uh, uh, bulk carriers, uh, etc. This was, this is of course the logic of the, uh, of the, uh, the Northern Sea Route. As, present, as the, the Russians would present it, to, to showing the, the shorter route from, say, between Europe and, and Asia, 
compared with the enormous distance you have to go through through, through the Suez Canal. Also, there's been some, some speculation about the security of the Suez Canal over the last year or so. Uh, Egypt has been a very stable country. It has put a very high priority on security over the last few years of the canal. But uh, if you look at the current political situation and the terrorist actions in, in, uh, in the Suez Canal, uh, you would, uh, uh, I, I would think you would worry a little bit about that. Obviously, the Northern Sea Route becomes extremely interesting and extremely important in the event of closure of the Suez Canal. All of this, uh, these are the shipping routes for natural gas from Russia. This is a uh, list of icebreakers where they, they are in the world. You can see the Russian icebreakers. You can see Canada's little icebreakers here. They put, that's typical of the enormous resources they put into it. New modern icebreakers that, uh, uh, that, uh, that Russia is buying, shaped like a peanut, can go sideways. Modern, uh, these are the search and rescue stations Russia is putting up along the Northern Sea Route, reviving old military bases, both for military reasons and and for us, search and rescue, because they realize what what damage would be done to their international reputation. This is the international framework for uh, search and rescue. This was an agreement of the Arctic Council. These are the various modest Canadian uh, 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 resources aimed at Arctic uh, Arctic. Uh, uh, search and rescue. We have obviously great distances, very limited resources, delays in procurement, etc., etc. You, you will all be aware of that. So that was the Nordic Orion. These are some of these modern vessels. Modern icebreakers have this, these axial, it's kind of like an outboard motor attached to the back that can go in any direction. You have icebreakers that can go with two bows, one for ice breaking and one for uh, normal travel. Many different technological fixes appearing, but what will matter most of all is the, uh, is the quality of the, the people and the human resources and government regulations that will ensure that all these developments will take place uh, without, uh, without some catastrophe. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thank you very much. And your patience for having me hover over you. <laughs> so, uh, if Susan can come up, that would be wonderful. Good morning, everybody. Um, Thanks for coming to this presentation. I'd like to thank uh, Northern Lights for uh, inviting me to come to uh, the conference this year and be a speaker. It's, it's, it's a great conference. We were here just as delegates a couple of years ago, and it's always a great uh, learning opportunity. Um, so I'm going to talk to you now about um, a little bit about the medical uh, side of uh, working in remote locations, you know, specifically the Arctic. Um, we're, um, so I want to tell you a little bit today about our experiences in um, the kinds of events that we've dealt with in uh, providing medical support for remote locations. And then uh, I'm going to make some suggestions about uh, some improvements that we can make or, or items to consider if you have remote operations and you're wanting to take care of the, of the human resources that you have. Um, so, who is Praxis? Uh, maybe give you a little bit of a description of what we do. Um, we're providing global telemedicine for corporate and government clients worldwide. Uh, we've been in business since 1997. Uh, we have um, all of the physicians that provide telemedicine advice for us are, are emergency specialist physicians trained in Canada. We have uh, emergency physicians licensed across the country so we can provide services in every uh, jurisdiction. And uh, our clients include a lot of people in the marine sector, offshore oil and gas, um, seismic fishing fleets. Uh, we have had the Canadian Navy, um, the Coast Guard, 
Uh, JRCC, we actually provide medical, uh, the medical advice for the international IMO TMAS, telemedical assistance at sea service uh, for Canada on the East Coast. Um, and we've recently, we're in 2013, we were chosen by the Clipper Around the World Race to provide their uh, worldwide medical support for their, um, for their uh, vessels. They have 12 racing yachts that are going around the world. They're currently just um, going from Australia to Singapore. Uh, they have a total of 650 crew members who are individuals who go on this race. Uh, so we're looking after them uh, remotely using telemedicine. Uh, so the, what's the reality of um, having workers in remote locations? Uh, the reality is that they can't call 911. Uh, so it's up to individual organizations when they're working in remote areas to set up their own kind of emergency response system. Uh, of course, you can tie into some government resources such as search and rescue. Um, and I know that Leonard's going to talk a little bit more about emergency response. Um, but in terms of medical issues, um, it, you can't call 911. So what are the alternatives? Um, so some of the challenges that we have seen over the years that we've experienced through uh, our work with various clients, um, so I'll just go through a number of these things. Uh, number one is the aging workforce. So um, workers in oil and gas and uh, mining and construction and pretty much everywhere in Canada are getting older. So they come to the workplace with uh, most likely a number of pre-existing health conditions. Um, and we, as companies and organizations, need to proactively manage this. Um, so, uh, John was talking about emergency response. If we have a major event like a, uh, you know, a ship runs aground or something sort of external to a vessel occurs, um, then there's a reaction. And uh, so, so that's, a, that's a really a safety event. But uh, there's some statistics from the shipping industry worldwide that show that most of the medical evacuations, so over 50%, are actually caused by health issues of workers. So they're having, they have a cardiac risk event or they have um, some sort of other major um, issue, health issue that's related to their own health as opposed to anything that's in, imposed by their workplace. So this is really something that companies need to start uh, paying much more attention to. Um, medevacs are expensive and they're risky. Um, as John showed you in the previous slide, the government medevac resources certainly in Canada are limited. They're a long way away from the north. Um, the vessel diversions, uh, certainly on the east coast, one, uh, one client's, their cost is about $100 a minute. So if you're talking anywhere in the range of 18 hours or more, that's over $100,000. Air medevacs are in the same kind of range of fifty dollars to $100,000 and up, depending on where they're going and what the, what the um, uh, you know, the complication of the, of the location where the patient is being met back from. In the shipping industry, they have estimated it's 100,000 euros of direct cost per medevac plus $60,000 of indirect cost for trying to find uh, a replacement medical person, uh, sorry, a replacement crew member to go and work on that vessel, the logistics of getting that person out to the vessel to replace uh, the person that's been come off. So those are large expenses and um, so again, uh, uh, companies need to plan for not only safety incidents but, but health. Uh, communications. Uh, communications are challenging in remote locations so uh, most of our clients are using satellite based communications which can be still unreliable in polar regions. Uh, lots of uh, companies in the telemedicine business talk about uh, you know remote video conferencing those kinds of things that typically takes internet with high bandwidth. Uh, and that is also expensive when you're going over a satellite connection and it can also be unreliable. Uh, so, and, and dedicated telemedicine systems that use these kinds of uh, connectivities typically tend to be pretty expensive. Um, and uh, so, then you still need someone at the other end. Um, in terms of, for workplace issues, um, the public health system doesn't really understand occupational health issues very well. So. Um, if an employee does get injured on the job and they need to be sent into a remote, uh, like a clinic or a hospital within the public health system, uh, public health system really doesn't understand occupational health issues and doesn't understand the need to um, minimize the amount of time that, that employee is off work and get them back to work as quickly as possible. Um, most physicians in our public health system in Canada do not have occupational health training. They, I think they get about two hours during medical school, so they don't really understand any of the issues related to occupational health. Um, 
they don't generally ask patients too much about their work environment. They might ask them why, uh, you know, what happened to them while they were, uh, when they got this particular injury, but then they don't really dig deeper to find out, well, is this asthma attack maybe related to a, some sort of a work environment, um, it, you know, some vapors or um, dust or those kinds of things. So they don't dig deeper to figure out, is there an underlying cause of this, uh, this illness that can be mitigated in the work environment. And again, they just they don't have this experience with creating modified duties and return to work programs, which helps to, to reduce the cost for employers. In our business, specifically around telemedicine, uh, we have found over the years that telemedicine is, is a fairly unique skill that not all physicians are comfortable doing, um, talking with patients remotely. Um, and some companies, I think, uh, with their remote locations think, well, I'll just call into the local emergency department, I'll talk to the doctors there about my, my workers um, or my health in incident. And, Really, the, the local ERs may or may not be able to provide them with the kind of support that they're looking for. Again, a lot of physicians uncomfortable talking with people they can't see or talking to patients they can't see. And so they tend to default to the, well, you know, you got to bring them in so I can see them. So, so we found that the physicians need uh, the right skills. And most of Canada, uh, as John just said, is remote. And I think uh, as we talk about the opening of these uh, northern routes and getting more cruise ships through there, uh, I think a lot of the passengers that are signing up for these cruises have no idea how remote Canada is. They have no idea that even though they see these little dots on the map that, so, that say that they're a town, that there, there is no hospital there. There's not, there's basic probably a nursing station or basic medical care, but there's not the capability to deal with a multi-casualty incident if that happened or any more serious um, uh, trauma or medical issues. So I think they're really um, a little bit uh, naive about what the North is like in terms of response. Um, I like these two pictures because, you know, the, I think people imagine the one on the top is what it's going to be like and they're unprepared for the, the image on the bottom is, uh, of, you know, being seasick for a week or longer um, or being thrown around or, uh, you know, those kinds of things. Um, so additional challenges that we find in our telemedicine business is that there's really no standardized training or, or, even, or regulation or licensing <laughs> for telemedicine providers. Uh, licensing in various jurisdictions in Canada is challenging. We have 13 uh, provinces and territories with 13 different sets of rules and regulations uh, around uh, physician licensing. Medical liability insurance, again, if you're uh, talking about um, physicians in emergency departments and calling in from a, a foreign uh, shipping vessel or a foreign cruise ship, those issues of medical liability uh, in, and coverage for foreigners is, becomes an issue. Um, in Canada, there's really no standardized requirement beyond first aid for the medical equipment and supplies that vessels are required to um, carry. So, um, so we, we find that every different employer uh, decides on their own what kinds of equipment and supplies they're going to have. Um, and so this is something that uh, is, is currently unregulated. There are a number of standards in the world. The International Maritime Organization has a standard for medical kits and supplies. But again, it's not really enforced and it's not, not standardized. Thank you. Um, so where is telemedicine? Uh, it can be anything from uh, talking on the telephone to sending images and digital uh, video clips to having a one-way video where the physician can see the patient or a two-way video or where they're having an interaction. Um, and then there's additional digital data available, digital stethoscopes, digital ECGs, ultrasound machines. So there's a whole sort of a spectrum of telemedicine. Um, for the most part, in the north, I think that uh, the, the low bandwidth solutions tend to be the best, is what we've found. Um, uh, telemedicine provides the opportunity for a physician to provide the required medical oversight for paramedic personnel, such as uh, paramedics, uh, physician assistants, um, and nurses. Uh, they can also use it to help to diagnose things remotely. Um, they can use it to give medication orders. So if you, again, that's carrying the right kits and supplies, allows a, a physician to actually order uh, um, procedures or medications. Uh, we can coach offshore medics on how to do certain things they may not be familiar with. Uh, we can provide advice about the need for medevac and the timing for that. And we can discuss cases with a receiving medical facility if a medevac has to occur. Uh, and we mostly provide reassurance for patients and also for on-site medical staff who might be out there on their own as the only medical provider and they want uh, sort of a second opinion. So our approach, uh, we use emergency physicians that are trained, uh, experienced with the right remote right triage skills. Um, we have, we're available 24-7. We have bilingual services across Canada. We also provide a personal health record and electronic medical record for all our calls. You can email photos and videos directly into our re uh, medical record system and we fax files 
from our system right to a receiving medical facility, and we can also do the occupational health follow-up as well. So there are some opportunities, as we said, to improve medical kits and supplies. I think that the, a lot of these medical kits deal well with um, trauma issues, but don't really deal well with chronic disease issues. So you look at a cruise ship, they should be carrying much more uh, chronic disease medications uh, to cover an older population who's traveling on a cruise ship who might run out of their heart medication or their diabetes meds and those kinds of things. Um, communications, uh, we found many times that the sick bays and ships don't have Sick bays and ships don't have direct access to telecommunications, either internet or phone. Sometimes they have to go to the bridge. So um, it's important to have that communication right from the sick bay um, and also <laughs> to have access to, uh, to a quality telemedicine service. Um, and we also recommend that there some, be some sort of a medical exam for uh, both crew and passengers on, on vessels. Or uh, So I'm talking a lot about marine, but it would apply to any remote camp as well. That. Um, Anybody going to a camp should have a pre-work medical exam so you at least identify if they have health issues and you can manage them. Um, for individual workers going to work in remote camps, if they are on any medications, they need to take at least double the amount of uh, their supplies because uh, it can quite often happen they get delayed by weather, their back-to-back -back doesn't show up, and they're there for another three weeks. So, um, and we also recommend that people have access to uh, put their information in a personal health record system so that it can be remotely accessed by uh, physicians in remote areas. So, the last thing about telemedicine is uh, we, let, we believe in keeping it simple. Start with the phone and then figure out if you can add more whistles and bells if they're needed to add value to the conversation um, or if you um, it can manage the, the, the case as it is. So, yeah, again, I said don't get really roped into glamorous type, uh, telemedicine type gear. You still need a person at the end to provide the service. Um, so we've had a few examples, uh, some cases where we've been able to save clients some, a serious amount of money uh, from avoiding medevacs. Um, and this is just a testimony from one of our clients for whom we've saved them quite a bit of money from telemedicine. So that's it for me. Um, so there are numerous um, health issues that need to be considered if you're working in a remote area. So um, we encourage you to think about those things. I have actually put this presentation on our website, practice.ca news. It's in that section, so if you want a copy of this, uh, please go there and feel free to send me an email if you have any questions. So thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank everyone for expressing an interest and in joining the session today. Um, <coughs> what I'll be here to speak to you about is the Arctic Coordination Center. And, uh, you know, I joked with my wife earlier uh, that we have 20 minutes and all she said was good luck. So, you know, I will definitely try to keep this to 15 minutes. Uh, I do have a tendency of rambling as I'm doing right now. Um, so what Arctic uh, Coordination Center is, uh, before I get into the specifics, uh, I'll just give you a higher level overview. It's a monitoring center that's based in Yellowknife, so it's a northern operation center that uh, operates under the mandate of uh, providing uh, an improvement to response times for search and rescue uh, for all northern operators, employees, uh, citizens, hunters. Um, but. To get into some of the just high-level facts, Canada is 9.98 uh, million square kilometers, obviously covering a lot of ground, as the other two speakers have alluded to. Um, surrounded by 243,000 kilometers of coastline, and uniquely, it's covered by three specific oceans, each of which have their own unique challenges uh, for any type of emergency response. So just some high-level facts about search and rescue within the Canadian uh, environment. Uh, incidences are on the rise. Uh, year over year, you're seeing more and more incidences that involve uh, government agencies, local authorities. Uh, we're trending over 9,000 search and rescue responses per year. Um, approximately over 1,000, about 1,000 uh, search and rescue are handled by the Canadian Air Force or Coast Guard. And the search and rescue region actually covers over 15 million kilometers, which is uh, quite, an, uh, quite amazing, actually. Uh, there are three joint rescue uh, coordination centers, and those are based out of Victoria, Trenton, and Halifax. Um, and uniquely, the ground and inland waters are handled 
very differently than uh, aerial and uh, coastal uh, search and rescue. So that's handled by local authorities. And the whole premise, as I, as I alluded to earlier, was uh, we're a northern-based monitoring center. But um, you know, what we want to promote and what we're very passionate about is uh, a neighbor-helping-neighbor neighbor approach where you know, people that are in the vicinity of a potential emergency or someone in trouble have the ability of providing assistance um, or at least giving authorities another option of, of uh, response. So introducing the Arctic Coordination Center. Uh, what you should know about it, it's a joint partnership between two companies, Scarlet Security, who is based in Yellowknife, and Absolute Track, who I represent, which is uh, based out of Calgary. Uh, we promote the neighbor helping neighbor philosophy. Uh, objective is to improve the timeliness of search and rescue response. We are not a search and rescue agency, we are a coordination center. Essentially, you can look at it as an information clearinghouse. We provide the necessary information in real time of the closest responder as well as where an incident occurred. Uh, we centralize all the information, so whether you're a uh, commercial, potentially government, or even private citizen, including hunters, um, part of an association, uh, we bring all that information into one system so that our coordination center and our personnel have the ability of seeing everything on one map and making an a educated decision or a response uh, immediately. We're hardware agnostic, so we don't force people to use a particular hardware or um, force them onto one outcome. Our, our users are able to use whatever device they decide to use and we integrate it right into our, uh, our system. Um, and as well, one important thing to make this whole program work is that all of the people with potential first response uh, capabilities would be joining onto the system for free. So uh, again, it's that neighbor helping neighbor approach. Uh, one thing about Absolute Track is that we are a technology company. Uh, so you know, we, we provide uh, real-time information to multiple business, uh, business units within a company or organization. And this is, uh, this is one avenue of what we've done, and uh, the technology is currently used by uh, the Alberta government for uh, work alone safety for approximately 3,000 uh, employees. That includes sheriffs, bylaw, uh, social workers, child services. So how does the system work? Uh, it works in just a few steps, but I'll quickly go through it and explain each step. So the first responders would join the system. So we would add them to the work alone system. It's a monitoring application. The users would enroll into the ARC program. Now, actually, if I can go back there. When people enroll into the program, one, uh, one thing that I'd like to mention is that everyone gets a customized emergency response plan. So you're not, you could have a different uh, you know, call out list on who needs to know what your check-in times are, what happens when an emergency is triggered. Uh, so that would differ from everybody. So the user would start their day and then sign on to the system, whether they're using a satellite-based device, a cellular phone, a smartphone, uh, a vehicle, a pendant, doesn't matter. Now if the user misses their check-in or they trigger an SOS alert, there's the ARC would notify the, sorry, ARC would execute the emergency response plan and then escalate to the search and rescue authorities. Now in this case, with the Northern Operations, the closest first responder would provide assistance. Whether you're a northern operator, you're a hunter, or even the Air Force or Coast Guard, the information is now made available so that the proper decision with the minimal response time can be made. So how do you, what are the next steps? How do we make this successful? Uh, we want to continue promoting this. Uh, generating public awareness is very important. Um, promoting this to northern communities, companies, associations. Uh, we want to increase the participation from northern aviation companies and first responders. I think that is key to the success of this program. Uh, continue to support as many devices as possible. Technology is always changing, and uh, I could be the first one to tell you how fast it's changing. Um, and lastly is to generate uh, employment opportunities in the north. 
Uh, I think I'm doing very well on time because I haven't seen anything fly up. And ironically, this is my last slide. So uh, I do thank you. Um, I hope I didn't speak too fast. And we do have a booth at, uh, on the third level. So if you do like to, would like to see a demo, uh, we have the system actually up and running. So we would be more than happy to walk you through it, answer any uh, detailed questions that you may have, and uh, more than happy to help you out. Thank you. So we do now have some time for questions. Uh, we have 15 minutes, um, and I would invite um, people to come up to the microphone and ask their questions. As moderator, I'm going to take advantage and ask the first question. So the um, presentations have been very informative. Um, one question that came to mind is that um, I think we're all aware that resources are very scarce in the north, uh, and uh, the conventional um, emergency services and coordination services are expensive. Uh, I heard a lot about how uh, what you're offering uh, may be more effective, but can you speak to um, how are th what you're proposing? Is it um, going to be more costly? Is it actually going to uh, save money to uh, use these services? Or are they going to be accessible to Northerners? So I guess that's three questions in one. Um, anybody on the panel would like to address those questions? Um, so uh, certainly uh, Susan and, and Leonard from a, a, a on the ground perspective, if John has a sort of a global perspective on if we're moving towards a system that's more cost effective. Well, I guess I can answer uh, first, I think, um, in terms of the telemedicine services. Uh, absolutely, we need to be doing more of this, not only in the north, but all the way across Canada. As our population is becoming much more urban, it becomes more and more difficult for uh, provincial governments to provide, you know, kind of comprehensive medical services for uh, for people in rural areas, never mind remote areas. So, um, absolutely, we need to be moving more towards that. The government systems or public health systems. Uh, there are some uh, uh, telemedicine examples at work now. I mean, the the uh, Ontario Telehealth Network is a big player in public sector uh, telemedicine. Uh, different from what we do, what they tend to do more with telemedicine is kind of pre-book consultation. So instead of flying from the north down to uh, to you know north, like Sudbury or down to Toronto to, to see a specialist, they're doing more tele book telemedicine consults with specialists. Um, so that's that's great. It's a wonderful service, and there's going to be more and more of that stuff happening over the years. But uh, so what, what we do with our company is we're on the emergency telemedicine side, which nobody in public health seems to do too much of. So uh, it's really about well, I, I'm in trouble now, and I need, I need to talk to somebody. And again, it's trying to it's trying to really prevent some of these search and rescue uh, events from happening. So how do we actually talk to somebody remotely, get them the care that they need remotely, so that we don't have to medevac them, or we or at least get ourselves some time. You know, time when you're talking about medevacs is, is crucial. So if we can possibly work to stabilize a patient so that when they do get medevaced, it's much less risky for everybody, and that's a good thing as well. We would like to see telemedicine happening a lot more with northern communities. You know, a lot of the really remote communities that have the nursing stations. From a from just a logistic perspective, it's extremely difficult to get into those communities and find out who's responsible for those nursing things. I know it's First Nations Inuit you know, Health Branch. Um, but you know, when you try to start to find out who's actually responsible, you get, you get a lot of this. That's not me. It's not me. So trying to trying to sell uh, our services to those organizations is extremely challenging. So I'd love to do it. I, I don't know if anybody has any suggestions for how we can <laughs> get to the right people. Um, you know, I'd love to hear them. But uh, that's our experience. Um, yeah, from our perspective, uh, we are a private company. Uh, there is a cost of doing business, but we do uh, follow legislation to make companies or allow companies to comply to the work alone legislation and the rules that are coming down from the government. Um, you know, I, I don't think it would be feasible to to not make a profit, but however, it doesn't. Uh, it's not to the point where it's uh, unrealistic and uh, makes it un, uh, unobtainable for regular citizens or hunters to, to join the program. What would be it? Do you know what the cost would be for an individual to sign up? Uh, yeah, it's you're looking at roughly thirty dollars per month uh, for the program. Um, you know, this is I'm basing this on the corporate uh, environment right now, uh, and there is a monitoring fee for any time that they turn on the system. So, 
they go out hiking for one for an instance, uh, they turn it on and then there's the monitoring. But if they turn it off for the day or they don't, they go on vacation for a month, then there's no fee. Well, just a, a much broader point, which is that I, I feel that uh, looking at Canada's relative state of development <coughs> in its Arctic, um, there is an opportunity for the federal government to review mm -hmm. its uh, northern strategy and its Arctic foreign policy in the light of the um, of, of the developments in the Arctic Ocean and developments of the. Uh, tremendous efforts that other countries, uh, particularly Russia and Scandinavia, are putting into Arctic development. But there, a, a great deal of federal effort over the last uh, 20 years has gone into uh, the process of devolution and the creation of Aboriginal self-government. Uh, this is all, all, all excellent, all excellent, but it is not, if you look at the flows of resources that go from the federal government up into the north, uh, that, that is, it, it's relatively meager and not adequate to uh, maintain the transport, energy, health, uh, education systems that we'll need to, to uh, up our game in the Canadian Arctic. And when I talk about, say, the importance of transportation, it's all dimensions of transportation. It's transportation that supports energy and, uh, and, uh, and resource development supports communities, that uh, uh, supports um, uh, supports mining, as somebody once said, a mine without transportation is just a hole in the ground. And um, we have a history of nation building uh, in Canada, where the big infrastructure projects, east-west infrastructure, have been built by federal governments, by governments over the last, uh, over the last 200 years railways, highways, ports, airports, and so forth. Whereas in the north, uh, certain amounts of money go uh, for health and education, and some small amounts for, for, for economic development. But I believe that the, we're at a stage now where Canadians, and Northerners in particular, would benefit from a, from a, a, a quantum leap in the amount of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, national e economic development infrastructure across the Canadian North, and particularly actually in, in cooperation with the United States, which has its uh, uh, issues too in relation to the developments in the in the Beaufort area. Hi, uh, good morning. I'm Danny Pottle, Nunatiwa, Kabamunga. I have a question for Leonard specifically, but before I, I uh, ask my question, I, I preface that by uh, reminding people of, I believe today is the second anniversary of, of a tragic incident that we had in Northern Labrador uh, two years ago with respect to uh, the um, search and rescue effort with respect to uh, young Burton Winters. Um, sadly enough, there's still a lot of questions related to that search and rescue effort, in particular with respect to, I guess, the coordination of search and rescue. Um, and the whole issue, I wonder if you can speak to it, the challenges with respect to jurisdictional issues when you're coordinating that. Uh, again, with this incident last year, two years ago, in Nunatsiabut, there was a lot of finger pointing with respect to federal or provincial jurisdiction and responsibility. So how do you, as a coordination center, deal with those challenges? And uh, maybe, is, in your opinion, is the for lack of a better word, decentralization of search and rescue centers, um, in particular with respect to some of the regional differences, i just use Nunatsiwut as an example. When you get a call from somebody in Nunatsiwut and that person is an intricate speaker, there are challenges with that. So how do you coordinate issues related to language and jurisdictional issues? Nakumi. Well, to um to talk about the jurisdiction, um, that is that is obviously a challenge. Um, the one thing that our company does, or ARC would do, is that they provide the information to the necessary agencies to make that decision. So, um, based on the response of, or the emergency that's occurring, um, 
all they would be able to do is provide the information to the local authorities to make that decision. All the information would be logged. Uh, so, you know, if, if the finger pointing was saying that no one contacted so and so and so forth, uh, that information is logged for reporting purposes. Um, but again, dealing with uh, which government agency to handle that search and rescue, unfortunately that's not uh, something that we, we are getting too involved with. All we are doing is providing the information so that the right agency can make that um, proper determination. Um, now to answer your other question about the, uh, the, the language barrier, uh, we are looking at setting up another uh, uh, monitoring center in Iqaluit, uh, which uh, would obviously, uh, one of the requirements just operating in the north would be to have uh, multi-language support. Uh, currently it is only English, um, however we are in the infancy of getting this program set up. Uh, there is a lot of legwork from the technology side to make sure that one, it, it does work, it is reliable, Two, we have the buy-in from the operators and people that are able to provide that support mechanism to uh, the people signing on to the program. And then from there, we would look at expanding the employment opportunities to the different regions. Hi, um, <clears throat> Lenny, as a uh, fixed wing and helicopter operator in the north right now, we're uh, considering being part of uh, uh, one of the operators that would actually buy into your program and provide you our locations of the aircraft at all times. I, I guess at the height of the season, there's probably in the summertime, there's about 150 aircraft flying over the Arctic at any given time. And in the short time or the winter season, probably about 30. So depending on a um, search and rescue aircraft from Trenton 1, Herc coming up to rescue some of the community, I would think the communities, anchors and trappers, uh, mining companies would definitely want to buy, out, uh, buy into this because they've got all these eyes and you know searching across the north at any given time to provide locations to their flight track satellite tracking systems. So I think for communities and for Labrador, for for I know in Iqaluit uh, last year there was a, a death as well. So I would think that the local communities would definitely want to see how they can be part of this. It's definitely worth the, worth evaluating. It. As an operator, I'm wondering how you would provide uh, privacy to the operator so that. The locations of my aircraft aren't the location. Nobody else has the locations of my aircraft. I want to be a part of this, right. and I want to be able to provide uh, services close by if I'm anywhere in the area. Right. But I also don't want to provide my information to every other operator out there because there's still competition, of course. Yeah. No, I, I appreciate that, Rob, and and that's a very valid question. I think uh, privacy is of the utmost importance to uphold within this type of environment because, again, you you are potentially sharing a location. You could potentially be sharing locations of your aircrafts to your competitors. So we are fully aware that um, that concern is uh, is valid. So what we would uh, you know, from our perspective, privacy being that utmost importance, we would be signing privacy uh, clauses. Uh, all the individuals within the monitoring personnel are uh, obligated to sign a non-disclosure, and the privacy and the location of your aircraft would never be shared with uh, anyone else. You're welcome. Hi, uh, my name is Astrid, I'm with the Government of Greenland, and I was wondering um, if you have considered the, the market in Greenland, and if so, what barriers there are, or what it would take? What's, sorry, who was that question for? Uh, for all three of you, yeah. Sorry, we considered what? We considered the marketing? The, the market in Greenland, like considering including Greenland in your, uh, is it oh. of any interest for you? Is it somewhere where you... Um, could it, could be interested in it, and in so, if so, what barriers do you see for entering? Yeah, um, we have actually we've talked with several partners about um, you know providing that personnel to go and work on seismic vessels, doing some of the some of the seismic work a couple of years ago. Um, you know, the challenge again from our point of view is just licensing for medical personnel. So uh, you know, what kind of paramedical people are licensed in Greenland, and who has to license them, and what's the how, how much does it cost to get people licensed there and then physician licensing there as well. So that's, it's really not something I've done a lot of looking into, so I don't really know if, if it's difficult or if it's easy. Um, but, so that, that would be a barrier for us, definitely. I mean, it's a barrier in Canada. We've got 13 different jurisdictions, 13 different licenses. So going to another country is also a challenge, but it's not, it could be overcome, absolutely. 
And from our perspective, yes, we are uh, very open to working in Greenland as well. I believe uh, our president just had a conversation yesterday uh, with, I believe, some of your delegates as well. So uh, we're very open to that uh, idea. Um, you know, anywhere that we can provide assistance to aid in, in these types of efforts, we're more than more than happy to have that conversation. I would just add one very gen general point, which is how important it is that the various people concerned with the, the Canadian Arctic cooperate very closely with Greenland and cooperate very closely with, uh, with Alaska on a whole variety of, of important issues. I'm a, a, a strong believer in the Arctic Council and the, the International, International Maritime Organization many other things, but uh, at the end of the day, real cooperation often develops out of, out of uh, bilateral or trilateral relationships that are simpler and more direct. I think we have time for one more question. <laughs> um, hi, <clears throat> my name is Martin, I'm with the government of Nunavut. Um, and my background as a field person, um, I am a first responder as well, based in Nukhaluit. And my question will be, how would you, um, how, how would you consider, you know, like an individual being part of your first responder team, or like uh, what kind of background or courses this person have been taking? And also, what will be the liability for this person to be part of your search, uh, search and rescue um, team? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if there's enough time to answer that question, yep. so I probably want to take that offline. I will go see you at your booth, I Okay, guess. perfect. <laughs> um, however, uh, to what are the, the qualifications? It, essentially, it's really any operator that has the ability of providing uh, assistance, not so much as a, a <laughs> medical response. It's, you know, do I have the capabilities of covering a lot of ground um, and being part of a program so that I can at least find where somebody is? Mm -hmm. um, you know, if it's a medical emergency, then it would need to be escalated uh, at that point. So it's, it essentially is triage as the call is happening. Um, the first thing that we, we identify is where the person is, who the closest person to uh, provide assistance. And that could be medical, that could be just you know, you're one kilometer away from this last known location. Can you go there and see what's wrong? Um, what about the liability around that? What are the liabilities? Um, that's a very good question. Uh, <laughs> I uh, don't know how to answer I'm just thinking, that. like, if, you know, like, a Canadian Rangers wants to be part of your group, or if individuals want to take on, or, you know, I know a lot of people in the field that, you know, are everywhere in the communities that might be might want to be take part of your right. group, you know. Um, but also, as you say, neighbor helping neighbors, right? Yes. But um, am I taking on, or the group is taking on the responsibility? Are they covered with your insurance and that sort of thing? It's also all of this. Well, that comes to my mind, you know, because right. the person is in danger. I'm going to help, um, or the rangers are going to help. How? Would they be covered, kind of thing? You know? I think maybe it's, maybe it's the lawyer she knows, but I think a lot of that response. If you're you're not being paid as a responder, mm -hmm. you're volunteering. So I think it comes under the Good Samaritan Act that basically you're responding out of the goodness of your heart to go and assist this person. So I think, from a liability perspective, that's somewhat covered, but probably something that you know you need to cover as well. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, as a lawyer, I don't think I'll give any legal advice. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but. Uh, uh, I just wanted to thank the panelists again uh, for their knowledge and um, <coughs> wonderful presentations and thank uh, everybody for coming to the session. And with that, I'd like to uh, close the session. Thank you.